Hi, this is Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who've died recently who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. Tonight we're going to start out with two doctors. The first is Dr. Jacob Samuel, who died recently at the age of 60. He was a colleague of mine. He worked with me for over 25 years in the Cook County ICU. He took over the directorship of the ICU when I retired, and I have to tell you, he was one of the best doctors that I ever saw. He was a gentle person an excellent diagnostician and clinician. He was wonderful with families, and he was wonderful with patients. He was also superb with procedures. He probably did more percutaneous tracheostomies than anybody in the world. That's a tracheostomy where you don't have to make an incision and don't have to take a patient to the operating room. With all those skills, he's the kind of doctor that any patient would want when they were in the ICU, and they just don't make too many like him. I can personally say I'll miss you a lot, Jacob. Our next doctor is Dr. Ted Stanley, who died recently at the age of 77, one of the top anesthesiologists in the United States, and he also became an entrepreneur. He was born in Brooklyn, did a lot of his work on the West Coast, but he finally settled at the University of Utah, and that's where he made his name as a clinician, a scientist, and a philanthropist. Dr. Stanley made his name as the inventor of the fentanyl lollipop, it's basically just a lollipop that's laced with fentanyl, an extremely potent opioid that's more potent than morphine. And it's used primarily to safely sedate children in the emergency room and in the operating room for procedures and occasionally for pain management. Dr. Stanley was an expert in opioids and he got the idea from sedating animals for veterinarians and he turned the fentanyl lollipop into a huge endowment business for the University of Utah. And here he tells the story. I've been somewhat successful in some of my entrepreneurial activities. One of them was the founding of a company called Anesta and the development of a concept of potent drugs in lollipops. And the fentanyl lollipop was born and turned out to be not a bad idea. Part of my background was to develop very potent drugs that could be put in a dart and safely dart moose and elk and deer. And that kind of research led to me studying monkeys, misting monkeys, to see if that would work to put them to sleep safely and rapidly. We were doing these monkeys with some veterinarians, actually in California, for this experiment. And the vet said, could you put some of that stuff in a sugar cube? So we injected some, and the mon monkey started, and boom, with a couple of smacks, on, you know, sucks on this sugar cube, he was knocked out safely. And so on the way back from Sacramento to Salt Lake, um, at 35,000 feet, thinking, monkeys, how can we do this for people? And that's where the idea of putting a drug in the lollipop and giving it to a child who needed to have surgery. The reason why I believe faculty should be at least open to the potential for commercialization is because that's the way good ideas and great ideas get to be real products that help real people with their real problems. Well, we're going to move on now to Jean Moreau, who died recently at the age of 89. She was one of the great female stars of the French New Wave films. I love Jean Moreau. Most of her films are in French, although there's one that's not, and we'll talk about that. And she's the star of the classic 1962 Francois Truffaut film, Jules and Jim, which is considered one of the finest films ever made. In French, it's known as Jules et Jim, and here's Matthew Bannister in the BBC for Last Word on Jean Moreau. Now, the actress Jean Moreau was a French icon. In films like Lift to the Scaffold and Jules et Jim, she became known for her combination of intelligence and sexuality and her gravity voice. Jeanne was the daughter of an English dancer who met her French café owner husband when she was performing at the Folie Bergère in Paris. But Jeanne's biographer, Marianne Gray, says her father disapproved of his daughter's choice of career. He was absolutely horrified. I think he, he slapped her and he said, I want you to be a teacher, to be something respectable, not an actress like a prostitute. And did she feel that that was something that motivated her, that she wanted to prove him wrong? Well, I think she was just such a determined person. She was determined to the end and she just carried on and she never let him know she was training. And at 16, she was acting. There are three French female icons, I think, in the acting world. It's 
Jeanne Moreau, Brigitte Bardot and Catherine Deneuve. And she's so much on her own patch. It's not like them at all. For you, what is the quintessential Jeanne Moreau film? I love Lift to the Scaffold. The film opens with her walking in the rain and she's going to meet her lover and they're planning to kill her husband. And she plays it so sexually. Mm, yes, wonderful film. How did she become a star? It was so unlikely because at the time her face was basically ugly. Her mouth went down instead of up and so on. And Julie Jim, I think, absolutely, the most famous film that she did... It was very ahead of its time, and she's charming and girlish and different, different. She wasn't the usual woman on screen. She was completely modern, completely real. And who were her lovers? Oh, countless. There were all kinds of people, like um, François Truffaut. François never spoke. I always was the one who spoke, and sometimes I didn't know what to say, so I would sing him songs I liked and things like that while we were having lunch, always at the same place, and he was always having the same dish. At that time, he was eating snails. And there was Tony Richardson, who was married to Vanessa Redgrave. There was Lee Marvin when she went to Hollywood. She had an affair with him, too. I mean, she just was part of the whirlwind of life and grand amour. She loved big love. <sighs> What about her marriages? Ah, oh, now you're talking. The first marriage was the day after, or the day before she had her son, Jérôme, and that was to a French uh, actor-director, Jean-Louis Richard, who died recently. And then, quite unexpectedly, in 1977, she married the American director, William Friedkin, who'd come over to Paris because he was looking for somebody to dub The Exorcist. They got on very well straight away, and she said, we were walking through some garden in Paris, and he said to me, will you marry me? And I was just so staggered, he was so brave to ask me. And I believed he was 15 years my junior. So I said, yes, why not? Then they got married. How long did it last? Uh, not terribly long, and he took her to Hollywood, and he wanted her to be known as Mrs. William Friedkin, and she said, absolutely not. She didn't like Hollywood at all. And when they got divorced, she discovered he was only seven years younger than her. What was it like to go to meet her? Oh, it was absolutely terrifying, because everybody said how difficult she is to interview. But in fact, she isn't. You've just got to give it to her straight, or had to give it to her straight. I got a phone call saying, come to tea this afternoon. I believe you're coming to Paris. And I was absolutely terrified. I had to borrow clothes in Paris to go, because you couldn't go in jeans and a T-shirt. You felt you should dress up to oh, see jean -Marie. Yes, I went to her lovely apartment and she's absolutely charming and we had about six cups of tea and it was just wonderful. Do you know there's a French saying that says one has never seen a safe follow a corpse at the burial ceremony. I love that. So as long as I earn money, I spend it. If I don't earn a lot, I won't spend a lot. But that's the way I live. Well, I mentioned her affair with Lee Marvin. That was when she was in Hollywood. She did another one of my great underrated movies, the 1970 version of Monty Walsh with Lee Marvin. It's the best acting Lee Marvin ever did, far better than Cat Blue, which he won the Academy Award for. And it was quite unexpected to see a French film star like Jean Moreau in this western. She plays a prostitute dying of tuberculosis, and he plays her boyfriend, a cowboy who sees the West dying. Shut up, all right. Did you write 40 miles to tell me then? I was thinking we should get a job in the party. That's not something. I like it. Marriage is a common ambition in my profession. Didn't you know that? Don't you want to think about it? No. The idea has always appealed to me. I thought it might have been. You better stay away from the cowboys. The way things are going, the cowboy doesn't make enough money to live right. He's not going to get my lots of food. Waiting. I've been waiting. Just sit down. Superb movie. Catch it if you get a chance, and don't settle for the made-for-TV remake with Tom Selleck. Well, as long as we're talking about westerns, let's move on to Ty Harden, who died recently at the age of 87. He was the star of one of those Warner Brothers television westerns for four years in the late 50s, early 60s, Bronco. He wasn't much of an actor, but he was good-looking, and the studio brought him in because they were having trouble with Clint Walker and Cheyenne. They finally gave him his own western. Bronco was one of their B-Westerns on ABC that Warner Brothers gave them, but it was popular for a little while, and here's a little bit of the theme song, and you can tell it's a cut below Maverick. <laughs> Born down around the old 
Franco is supposedly a Confederate soldier who returns from the war to Texas and he doesn't have anything to do, so he does good deeds all the time, sort of a third rate paladin. Here he is with Sue Randall as a religious pioneer. You really believe in miracles, don't you? You came, didn't you? I was on my way to Fort Jackson and you just keep believing. Mr. Lane, I've never met a man of violence before, and yet you're so gentle. I'm afraid there's some folks who wouldn't quite agree with you. Oh, I know you killed, but why don't I fear you? Better get on back with the others. You're too tempting a target. Bronco, that's a strange Christian name. When I was a young and I had some Indian friends that taught me how to tame wild horses. They pinned the name on me. From them you learned violence. From them I learned many things, especially how to protect myself. With a gun, a knife, or a bow and arrow. When a rattlesnake comes at you, you kill it, even if it's disguised as a man. I'll pray for you. I'm obliged. I'll back you up with this. Mr. Lane. It's together. A man behind you on the rock. What do you suggest I do? Shoot! Well, she makes it to California to become Beaver Cleaver's teacher. And in real life, Ty Harden left show business, got married about seven or eight times, and joined some crazy right-wing organization. But he was part of the Western Graves on television in the late 50s. So by way of the introduction of our next subject, there's this. The many roles I play call for many hairstyles. So I use hot curlers, blow dryers, things that can be brutal to hair. I switched from one conditioner to another looking for help. Then came Alberto V05 hot oil treatment. It works just like a sour hot oil treatment, but takes less time and money. I just heat a tube, smooth it in, and shampoo. My hair is left silky, shiny, more manageable than I ever dreamed. Alberto V05 hot oil treatment. I'll never switch again. There was an actress named Rula Lenska, nobody knew who she was, but we're introducing Leonard Lavin, who died recently at the age of 97, and he was the man who built Alberto Culver into a worldwide conglomerate. He was a nice Jewish boy from the west side of Chicago. After the war, he was walking down State Street and noticed that Walgreens had a lot of cosmetics for women, and he became a cosmetic salesman. Eventually, his company merged with Alberto Culver, and their VO5 product became a worldwide bestseller. VO5 stands for Five Vital Oils because the company had made a deal with Vichy France during the war to import oils when no other company could import to the United States. He ran the company, became very successful before his company sold out, and he became a philanthropist, giving a lot of money to the University of Washington. And here he talks to the students about becoming an entrepreneur. Nobody can teach you to become an entrepreneur, you know. It's what you got inside of you that matters. Well, be a risk taker. You know, when you get out of school, you may think you know what you want to do. You really don't. Take the first job that somebody offers that you think would be interesting, but don't take it for money. Take it for opportunity. You know, if you think you can move up and move up and move up and explain to you what the position is, you don't like it, get off the merry-go-round. Take the next one. Take the next one. Until you find something you really like, you have a passion for. Well, I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer and IT genius, Sid Tepps. And we're going to close with Jet Mack, who died recently at the age of 94, an Australian songwriter who wrote one of the iconic country songs of all time. Originally, it was for Australia, but you'll be familiar with it here in the United States. The first version I'm going to play is Lynn Anderson. Someone criticized me on the Lynn Anderson podcast because I didn't like Rose Garden, but I do like this one. Here's Lynn Anderson's version of Jet Mack's Opus Magnum. We're so very proud of Lynn Anderson. Let's hear from our wonderful little country singer, the song, I've Been Everywhere. I've been to Reno, Chicago, Fargo, Minnesota, Buffalo, Toronto, Winslow, Sarasota, Wichita, Tulsa, Ottawa, Oklahoma, Tampa, Panama, Nana, Malaya, Paloma, Bango, Salvador, Amador, Amarillo, I'm a killer, Amadillo, Amarillo, I'm a killer, I've been everywhere, man, I've been everywhere, man. Here's the man who made it an international hit. No, it's not Johnny Cash, it's Hank Snow. The man that's been everywhere, Hank Snow. I've been everywhere, man, I've been everywhere, man. Proud that is a bear, man, I breathe the mountain air, man. Travel, I've been my chair, man, I've been everywhere. Where you been, man? After being in Chicago, Fargo, Minnesota, Buffalo, Toronto, Windsor, Sarasota, Wichita, Tulsa, Harlem, Oklahoma, Alabama, Alabama, I've been everywhere, man. I've been everywhere, man.